Hi, good evening and welcome to Project 39A's uh, annual lecture series in criminal law. And I'd like to thank Professor Prabha Koteswaran for accepting our invitation to deliver the 2019 lecture on castle politics of sexual violence, notes on a political economy of criminal law. Uh, Prab uh, Prabha Koteswaran is a professor of law and so, uh, social justice at King's College London and has developed an extremely influential body of work on criminal law, feminist legal theory, and post-colonial legal studies. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with her work, and that's why you're here, so I'll dispense with the more uh, detailed introduction. Um, and, and just leave with a few comments in terms of uh, the motivation behind this lecture. Um, and I think we live in extremely paradoxical times. Uh, on the one hand, uh, are clear signs of over-criminalization and harsher punishments, and we see some very clear instances of that in terms of harsher punishments in cow slaughter laws, uh, criminalizing triple talaq, uh, the constitutional validity of criminal defamation being upheld, uh, the Supreme Court giving itself unto, it to, unto itself powers uh, to remove the government's power of remission and sentence people to the rest of their natural life without no, with no possibility of release. Um, harsher organized crime legislations, and, and in addition to that, some extremely worrying amendments uh, to anti-terror legislation. So there is that uh, mood of over-criminalization, harsher punishments to deal with many social issues in the country. But at the same time, uh, there is also a very distinct, violent, and public uh, repudiation of the law as such. And, and there are many instances that we read on a daily basis about that. And as the dynamics of power between the government, the people, and the courts undergo significant renegotiation, the increasingly punitive approach uh, gives us a lot to think about. Um, and, and in that context, um, the punitive approach to sexual violence as expressed through the IPC amendments uh, uh, in 2013, in 2018, and the amendments to the POXO uh, in 2019 um, is, has to be placed in this larger context of overcriminalization and what it means uh, to address sexual violence through these means. Um, and in particularly in more recent days, as the wheels of our legal system move faster, uh, to carry out the death sentences for Mukesh, Vinay Sharma, Pavan Kumar, and Akshay Kumar uh, Singh in, in the Delhi gang rape case from December 2012. Um, uh, these are some very tough questions that will arise in the next, uh, I won't even say months, in the next few weeks ahead of what is this relationship uh, between um, sexual violence and criminal law and how should we negotiate this relationship between sexual violence and criminal law. Uh, I'm sure uh, Prabha's lecture today will help us navigate some of these tricky waters, uh, and I'm sure will uh, leave us with a lot to think about uh, at the end of the lecture. So without further delay, uh, Professor Prabha Koteswaran. Thank you, Anu. Thank you for that very kind uh, introduction, and thank you all for being here today. So the title for my talk, as you know, is The Castral Politics of Sexual Violence, uh, Notes on a Political Economy of Criminal Law. We are witnessing today an incredible phase in the development of Indian criminal law. Laws long dormant have undergone radical reform, and new laws have come into force, even as additional proposed laws await their turn on the parliamentary list of business. In recent years, Parliament has passed numerous laws on various aspects of sexual violence, including the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 2013, or CLA, as I will call it, the Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act 2012, or POXO, the Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace Act of 2013, the Juvenile Justice Act of 2015, and most recently, the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 2018 and the POXO Amendment Act of 2019. Pending are the Surrogacy Regulation Bill of 2019, the Transgender Persons Protection of Rights Bill of 2019, and the government may well introduce the Trafficking of Persons Prevention, Protection, and Rehabilitation Bill of 2018, which lapsed in Parliament earlier this year. Even as these laws jostle with each other to address realities on the ground, they fit awkwardly as their internal logics clash with each other in terms of how offenses have been defined, are prosecuted, and are punished, arising as they do from different eras of lawmaking in colonial and post-independent India. 
Some often have more than one goal, including the seemingly conflicting goals of welfare and retribution. Multiple lawsuits are pending in the appellate courts that are geared towards taking the spirit of reform to their logical conclusion or locating discrepancies between laws to close loopholes or yet again revisit new laws in light of jurisprudential developments in constitutional law. Thus, although the CLA was said to have raised the age of consent to 18 because of POXO, the exemption for marital rape has a different age limit, leading to the decision by the Supreme Court in the independent thought versus Union of India case, which held that sex with a wife under the age of 18 would constitute rape. There is likely litigation to bring the prohibition of Child Marriage Act 2006 in line with POXO to hold child marriage void and equalize the age of marriage for men and women. Litigation to criminalize adult marital rape may well proceed, both to complete the task that the CLA set out to do, which is to protect the sexual autonomy of women, but also in light of the right to privacy decision in the Supreme Court, of the Supreme Court in Puttaswamy versus Union of India. Meanwhile, the impunity of state and patriarchal violence continues to persist, with numerous cases of spectacular sexual violence, such as Unawa and Katwa. But we are faced with a glaring input-output problem. We ask for systemic changes in the criminal justice system. Instead, we get reams of criminal legislation. Admittedly, the state had to pass the CLA 2013 under pressure of time. But with five intervening years, was the urgency similar when it came to the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 2018 or the POXO Amendment Act of 2019? Why then are we in a situation where the increase in minimum mandatory punishment for rape simpliciter has wiped out the distinction between rape simpliciter and aggravated rape, a distinction that has been on the books in the IPC and the CLA of 2013. Similarly, with the POXO Amendment Act of 2019, the minimum mandatory punishment for aggravated penetrative sexual assault is now 20 years, which may extend to life imprisonment or death. However, under the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 2018, aggravated rape of a girl under the age of 16 is punishable with 20 years imprisonment or life. But where a girl is between the ages of 16 and 18, uh, is if she's raped, her rapist will get a higher sentence under POXO than under the IPC. As such, Section 42 of POXO requires the higher sentence to be awarded, yet it is indicative of how the levels of punishment are being increased year on year. Thus, the only reality we can be sure of is the expansion of the Indian state's carceral imagination on sexual violence. So what are the vocabularies currently in use to justify this carceral imagination? What is so enduring about the symbolic role of the criminal law that governments of practically all political persuasions unfailingly resort to them? How do we resist this carceral imagination? Are our critical vocabularies outpaced by realities on the ground? How can we reimagine a renewed vocabulary that can go beyond the familiar terms of the justice gap and a discourse of failed and corrupt implementation by the state on the one hand and the abuse and misuse of the criminal law by opportunistic social actors on the other? Do the logics of patriarchy and capitalism suffice to explain the carceral turn, or have they run their course? If we find use in these progressive vocabularies, at what cost? What do they help render visible and render invisible at the same time? Is there a space for progressive politics wherein we can re retain a role for the criminal law without buying into the seduction of carceral politics? Is there a space for progressive lawyers in all of this? After all, the contestations are as much between right and left as within the left and within the legal profession itself. Professor Upendra Bakshi once proposed a useful typology of advocates to include nihilists, evangelists, moderates, and eclectics. Nihilists, he claimed, trash the law and have little faith in its ability to deliver justice. Evangelists appeal to the law as a site of reform passionately, but also blindly. Moderates have tempered expectations of the law's potential for justice. And finally, eclectics harbor unpredictable dispositions towards the law. Analyzed through Professor Bakshi's lens, evangelists feature prominently on the question of sexual violence. They are often doctrinalists who advocate for individual autonomy, while the moderates and nihilists have a structuralist understanding of power relations, as well as a keen appreciation for the informality at play within the Indian legal system. And importantly, what do we do now when bills are not referred to parliamentary committees or the voice vote drowns out constructive criticism of laws? The mobilization against the POXO Amendment Act passed earlier this year in August was quite telling. 
Children's rights groups repeatedly cautioned against the imposition of the death penalty, as victims would be less likely to report crimes, given that the majority of the offenders are known to victims, that it would undermine the success of the trial, that the death penalty is against international law and practice, that it is used arbitrarily and against the most marginalized sections of Indian society who are subject to police torture, and that one-fifth of the cases, according to them, involve consensual sex by teenagers and that increased minimum mandatory sentences, including the use of life imprisonment, would result in, and has resulted in, fewer convictions. They spoke in one voice that strengthening the system was needed rather than amplifying punishments, and that the amendment was anti-child regressive and counterintuitive. And this opinion was actually widely supported by judges and senior lawyers alike. So why is merely being seen to be doing something about sexual violence enough? What explains the lawmakers will not to know? Even if I don't address all of these questions directly in the course of the next hour, I do hope that they will serve as provocation for our research in the years to come. Now, the carceral turn in relation to sexual violence is not unique to India, and has been extensively theorized in the context of North America by Kristen Bumiller and Elizabeth Bernstein, and in Europe by Nicola Mai, where it is broadly linked to the idea of neoliberal penality. And here I paraphrase these authors and other influential criminologists. Neoliberal economic policies are set to result in the withdrawal of the welfare state from social provisioning, necessitating the housing of the dispossessed in the prison industrial complex where black and immigrant men are incarcerated, while the therapeutic state caters to women subject to domestic violence and prostitution. Feminists abandon, more or less, problematizing the family as a site of inequality and oppression. Their rightward move is matched by the leftward move of conservatives, a new generation of whom is interested in less polarizing issues than abortion and homosexuality. Together, they prioritize marriage as a legitimate site for affective heterosexual relationships, a middle-class bubble made possible by the securitized state. Capitalism, meanwhile, seeks to redeem itself by investing in these social issues so as to legitimize its own highly exploitative post fordist work arrangements. The thesis is somewhat similar for Europe, except that it has a left, which often supports feminists in their castral projects. Now, key also to these sexual politics is the displacement of the issue of sexual violence to the international sphere as a problem out there affecting developing countries, which demands a militarized humanitarian response. Now, it is hard to sustain a thesis of neoliberal penality even in the West, where its coherence has been severely challenged, much less so in the Indian context, given the very different trajectories of the developmental state, its neoliberal policies, and the decrepit state of our criminal justice system and welfare bureaucracy. However, as I will show, we can track the emergence of governance feminism alongside militarized humanitarian interventions undertaken by NGOs. Some patterns are also emerging which could help offer a theory of sex and gender as the criminal law shapes the political economy of sex. Thus, sex outside marriage, which was punishable under the IPC as adultery, is now no longer a crime. Similarly, Section 377 has been re read down as unconstitutional. At the same time, however, the Surrogacy Regulation Bill deems procreation through market-mediated assist market assisted reproductive technologies a crime and punished quite severely. Um, Alternate forms of livelihood fostered by transgender kinship practices could be criminalized as forced and bonded labor under the Transgender Persons Bill. The utterance of talaq thrice will attract criminal penalties under the Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Marriage Act of 2019. And meanwhile, POXO enlists the surveillance efforts of numerous institutional actors to counter child sexual abuse, but preserve children's quote-unquote sexual innocence while criminalizing consensual adolescent sex. So there seems to be... Um, certain heteronormative family forms that are clearly the preferred site for both sex and reproduction. What is telling, however, is the mirroring effect that the carceral turn in the global north has produced in the global south. So speaking in the Lok Sabha to support the Criminal Law Amendment Bill of 2018, Konda Vishweshwar Reddy, then of the TRS, angrily bemoaned the unequal coverage that Kathua gets in the New York Times when compared to a domestic US rape. He observed, if a crime is committed, is the criminal solely responsible or is the society partly responsible? Definitely, sir, so society is. But I think the foreign media is making the entire country responsible. Should we hang the criminal or should we hang the whole society? I think we should hang the criminal, and that is the mood of the nation today after seeing the gruesome acts here. Now, appearing to take action and save the face of the nation against incidents of sexual violence, which are viewed as aberrant um, and as 
um, deserving of exceptional punishment seems to be uppermost in our parliamentarians' minds. These developments need to be theorized more comprehensively. However, my task today is to offer notes on a political economy of criminal law, because it actually seems to me to be urgent that lawyers and law academics must urgently respond to the castral politics of sexual violence in the spirit of Article 39A of the Constitution. In particular today, what I want to do is compare two case studies, namely rape and trafficking. In 2013, the Burma Committee became the site of confluence for feminists of many stripes who pursued parallel tracks of advocacy on rape and trafficking. However, a lot more is known about the advocacy around rape rather than around trafficking. Although the second longest chapter in the Verma Committee report after rape was on trafficking, despite it not being on the agenda of the Indian women's movement. And there is another substantive reason to compare rape and trafficking. In relation to rape, Veena Das has pointed out that the legal outcomes vary between different categories of women depending on their place in what she calls a system of alliance. That is, women either circulate within the marital economy or are considered unchaste and fall outside it, becoming available for sexual experimentation. Gail Rubin's observation that the ultimate locus of women's oppression lies within the traffic of women through kinship systems couldn't be truer than in the Indian context, laid over by the requirements of caste endogamy. Thus, marriage is considered to be the legitimate site for all sex. Even sex, both intercourse and practices without consent, would not be raped given the marital rape immunity within the IPC. The centrality of marriage as a site for legitimate sex is so much a part of the Indian female psyche that sex outside marriage can only be imagined in terms of sex without consent or rape, as Sneha Christian's ethnography of female students in Chennai suggests. Similarly, whether in the elopement or breach of promise to marry cases, women assert sexual agency outside the bounds of marriage, but exchange sex on the basis of a secure future in marriage. Even then, this very consent to sex becomes the basis for prosecuting rape. But there is a political economy of sex outside marriage. Poorer women whose marriages fail often enter sex work. Thus, 75% of sex workers in Sonagachi were once married. And there is little clarity on the legal status of market-mediated sex. Under the Immoral Traffic Prevention Act 1986, or ITPA, the sale of sex for money per se is not a crime. However, Section 5 of the same act punishes procuring or causing a woman to sell sex as trafficking. Thus, sex work, even if voluntary, is equivalent to trafficking. And although the Verma Committee clarified that the standalone offense of trafficking would not cover voluntary sex work, a broad interpretation of the result in Section 370 in the CLA could recharacterize voluntary sex work as trafficking for quote unquote sexual exploitation. Now, meanwhile, a sex worker engaging in sex work without consent would find it very difficult to sustain a prosecution for rape. So it is this extraordinary conversion through the criminal law of consent into non-consent and non-consent into consent, both within marriage and sex work, uh, which requires us to understand these side by side. At the very least, we need to puncture the unstable boundary lines between them and the law's own patriarchal logic, which views certain categories of women as deserving protection from rape and other unrapeable women, uh, namely sex workers, as needing rescue and rehabilitation. Um, so rape and trafficking are suitable for comparative analysis for other reasons which I set out in the slide, but I won't really explain in detail. I'll just simply say that rape is considered to be a truly criminal offense, whereas trafficking uh, is considered to be wrong because it is prohibited. Rape is more or less a domestic legal issue, whereas trafficking arises from India's international law obligations. And we find that in rape that there is a fair degree of feminist convergence, whereas with trafficking we find uh, a high level of uh, feminist divergence. Also, rape is a high visibility issue. So, um, of course, the circumstances were unique, uh, but the Verma Committee received 70,000 responses in 2013. And uh, whereas trafficking is a low visibility issue, so that when the Ministry for Women and Child Development uh, invited submissions on the trafficking law, there were about 300 submissions. And finally, both these laws were actually initially uh, introduced, or rather reform was introduced in 2013, and then five years later, their castral infrastructure was sought to be expanded. And so, in fact, the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 2018 was passed by the Lok Sabha literally days after the trafficking bill was also passed by the Lok Sabha on July 26th. And so you find in the imagination of parliamentarians uh, cross-references between these two laws. Um, so next, I want to outline some preliminary thoughts on a political economy of criminal law. Uh, there are at least four registers for discussing uh, the political economy of criminal law, and I'm sure there are several more. 
So the first sense in which I use political economy is to grasp the totality of criminal laws as such, and as being in dynamic interaction with each other, rather than viewing them in silos, each of which then attracts the attention of specialist stakeholder groups. Importantly, ideas about a good enough criminal law response to sexual violence is established in the minds of legislative draftspersons. So key technical ideas therefore circulate and are manifest in the letter of the law. Thus, several provisions of the CLA derive from the POXO Act of 2012. The CLA uh, provisions then influence the Trafficking Bill of 2018, and more recently, an offense of aggravated trafficking by administering hormones to hasten sexual maturity, which appeared in the Trafficking Bill, is now reformulated as aggravated sexual assault in the POXO Amendment Act of 2019. So key provisions in these laws also bear a family resemblance. There are benefits for victims in all of them, but they also allow for punishment for failure to report, have non-bailable offenses, reversals of burden of proof, minimum mandatory sentences, life imprisonment, including for the remainder of one's life, special courts, special public prosecutors, a specific time period for resolving a case, and importantly, the incorporation of civil society actors in the law's implementation. Now, the second register of the political economy of criminal law has to do with the process of making law itself. Whether a criminal law does or does not work is as much a function of how it is enforced as how it came to be, who wanted them, and who fed the state ideas of criminal law. The flattening discourse of democracy whereby different constituents are simply thought to appeal to the state is not adequate to explain the growing role of civil society actors in influencing lawmaking. We need a more granular understanding of how laws are made. And the impetus for this comes from our radically expanded ideas of governance inspired by Michel Foucault's genealogy of modern forms of governmental knowledge and practice in his College de France lectures of 1977-78 and 78-79. Janet Halley elaborates on Foucault's thesis of the governmentalization of the state in governance, feminism, and introduction to highlight how the sovereign alone does not regulate the conduct of men, and that conversely, feminism has become incorporated into larger forms of governmental reason. But this influence on the state does not come only from the left. As I'll show, we find it across the political spectrum. And Partha Chatterjee's assessment of Foucault's thesis in the postcolonial context is pertinent here. Chatterjee speaks of how the postcolonial state exercises both juridical and discursive power, and goes on to map its effects on the political relationship between the state and its subjects of governance. Civil society in his scheme is therefore a limited sphere of action in which the elite, a small section of culturally equipped citizens, engages with the state in the vocabulary of liberal citizenship. Civil society stands in contrast to political society wherein the state secures leg its legitimacy in relation to subaltern population groups through welfare governmentality. And we can productively apply this to an analysis of criminal lawmaking, wherein civil society actors influence the passage of formal state law, litigate in the appellate courts through public interest lawsuits, and work with the executive on the ground. Population groups like sex workers, on the other hand, also mobilize, but their politics are fragile and contingent. They, in fact, instrumentalize the law as a shield against the state's attempts to abolish sex work, rather than as a sword to further their rights as workers. And to the extent that increased criminalization is a source of illegality, how those in political society negotiate with the state bears useful lessons for us in rethinking carceral politics. Now, the third register for outlining the political economy of criminal law lies in how the law is implemented. So Professor Upendra Bakshi proposes that law reform efforts can be typologized as regulatory law, law reform, namely changes to statutory law or other legal doctrine, governance reform or changes in institutional practices, and social reform or changes in social attitudes. Needless to say, social movements want reforms at all three levels, and there is a highly recursive and inter interdependent relationship between social reform, governance reform, and regulatory reform. But the pace at which reform at these levels can be achieved varies quite significantly. Regulatory reform invariably leads to some institutional reform and is only an initial step in the long struggle for social reform. We can imagine this in the form of a, a pyramid where ideally there is limited regulatory reform, substantial governance reform, and extensive social reform. However, around the world, feminists have offered a robust critique of rape law as failing to reduce sexual abuse against women, generating in turn high levels of attrition in rape cases, resulting in what they call a justice gap. One could call this critique the structural bias thesis. 
So the criminal law may be informed by substantive bias, say when it permits the marital rape immunity, or the legal system may suffer from a procedural bias in failing to implement the law both internally, both literally and in spirit. High levels of informality, for instance, lead to the poor enforcement of laws often accompanied by endemic corruption. As Pratiksha Bakshi has shown, rape trials are pornographic in the humiliation of survivors and medicalization produces the consent of the survivor to sexual intercourse and reveals the support, supposed falsity of her complaint. Now, the law may also suffer from a bad faith bias when the police collude with rapists to harass victims to withdraw their complaints or compromise rape cases. Survivors have been murdered for refusing to do so and others have killed themselves. Little surprise then that according to feminists, only 5% of reported rape cases result in conviction. Now, faced with this justice gap, feminists have defaulted to demanding additional regulatory reform. Feminists here are formalists. They believe that criminal law can and should be enforced 24-7, and that more criminal law means that the state will enforce it stringently, enough to then shift social norms and eradicate sexual abuse. Since 2013, the state has capitalized on this very strategy. Rather than enhance governance reform, the state has reached out for further regulatory reform. Not only that, it is the cases of spectacular sexual violence that shape regulatory reform and in the process exacerbate the unintended consequences of excessive criminalization on the bulk of the cases, many of which also involve consensual sex. We therefore have an inverted reform pyramid where all resources, whether in parliament or in the courts, are invested in extensive regulatory reform to the detriment of governance and social reform. So here is a visual representation um, which has reformulated itself. But anyway, it was a pyramid uh, a few hours ago. Um, but it's a visual representation of the drivers of criminal law reform for rape and trafficking. But I won't, I won't really go into too much, too much detail, except to wonder about how to break out of this impasse. Um, and I suggest that it would be to acknowledge the structural bias thesis, but also to engage in a legal realist analysis of rape laws. Um, so here I use in particular Duncan Kennedy's idea of the toler tolerated residuum of abuse. He cautions that criminal laws against the sexual abuse of women will never operate 24-7, and that the legal system will always tolerate a certain level of sexual abuse, which in turn depends on social decisions about what abuse is and how important it is to prevent it. And this affects practices of abuse and so social practices of both men and women whether they themselves are abusers or survivors or are completely unrelated to the abusers and survivors. So Kennedy's idea of the tolerated residuum of abuse turns the feminist problematic of the justice gap on its head, questioning the very assumption that the law can eliminate sexual abuse while also tempering unrealistic expectations of regulatory reform. A legal realist analysis further assumes that in any given scenario, there are far more legal rules at play than typically meets the eye. Therefore, we may think of wage labor contracts purely in terms of contract law. But Morris Cohen, an American legal realist, argued that contract law can be operationalized only because the state chooses to exercise its sovereign powers in favor of one party over another. So for him, contract law was a subsidiary branch of public law. Similarly, Robert Hale theorized the relationship between labor law and property law. And the system of private property law, according to him, uh, protected by state power, engenders inequality, forcing workers to then exchange their labor for a wage. Applying this to rape, then, we consider not only rape law, but also background legal rules, for example, family law rules, that determine the bargaining power, powers of offenders and survivors of sexual abuse. Finally, legal realists do not assume that the legal system as a whole deliberately decreases one Thing or another. So as Kennedy notes, rather they conceptualize the network of private rights and public regulations as providing background rules that constitute the actors by granting them all kinds of powers under all kinds of limitations, and then regulating interactions between actors by banning and permitting, encouraging and discouraging particular tactics of particular actors in particular circumstances. So the inability of the legal system to address sexual violence cannot be explained away simply by the material and ideological stranglehold of patriarchy, capitalism, or capitalist patriarchy. Instead, men and women can be viewed as having varied sets of bargaining endowments that they exercise against each other, leading to fluid, even if predictable, outcomes. A legal realist assessment of rules is, however, not post-feminist. 
It sets out the actors involved, not merely identifying the central legal rules, but also unearthing background legal rules, and then identifying the surplus, so to speak, rather than offering an account solely of the injury involved, namely discrimination, inequality, or violence, and the loss response to it. So a fluid account of the law can then help us push back against moralizing accusations that women lie about sexual abuse, when in fact they are leveraging their legal entitlements to bargain with men. Further, legal realist analysis renders visible the vastly varied stakes of different groups of men and women in the laws against sexual abuse, vis-a-vis uh, -vis each other, but also amongst themselves. Thus, we may be hard-pressed to identify and further a coherent notion of women's interests. And this finds resonance in intersectional um, analysis of rape, but also in a Marxist feminist theory of rape that claims that every class has its own women question. So I'm going to go back two slides just to, um, yes. So to talk about the final register of political economy. And here I invoke uh, the register of economic life itself. So feminists like Anusha Rizvi and Manisha Sethi have questioned the fetishizing of sexual violence over the violence of the state, caste oppression, displacement, poverty, and hunger. With trafficking, which I'll soon talk about, the displacement of economic interests is even more stark. Law reform is geared towards addressing the sensationalized sexual violence of women in brothels while ignoring the constitutional mandate to prevent the forced labor of millions of Indian workers, forced labor having been interpreted by the Supreme Court as any payment less than the minimum wage. Not only that, the Trafficking Bill of 2018 is an example of how the criminal law colonizes the space of other regulatory domains, including labor laws and social welfare laws. I now turn to my case studies. I start with an account of how rape law reform was achieved before assessing its implementation through a legal realist analysis. I will then trace the processes that led to the drafting of the, of the 2018 trafficking bill to query, using a legal realist analysis, the expansive role for the criminal law in the presence of background legal rules that could ensure more effective redistributive outcomes. So, um, Right, so here I want to discuss uh, the making of the rape law. How the CLA was formulated and passed is a well-known story, so I won't get into it in much detail, except to say that I've shown in Governance Feminism and Introduction how rape reforms exemplify the emergence of Indian governance feminism. Governance feminism here simply means efforts that feminists have made to become incorporated into state-like state and state-affiliated power. Governance feminism is not a pejorative term. It's, it is simply a call on feminists to acknowledge their influence on the state's thinking on sexual violence. So in the said book, I mapped feminist efforts to amend rape law from 1979 onward till 2013 to argue that Indian feminism has placed an increased reliance on criminal law, has a deep commitment to a highly gendered reading of sexual violence, and has a diluted oppositional stance vis-a-vis -vis state power. I argue that the zone of opposition to criminal law has shriveled within Indian feminism over the past three decades. Feminist resolute opposition to the death penalty for rape post-2013 is a far cry from their deep suspicion of all aspects of criminal law at the start of the Indian women's movement, where feminists were wary even of reversals of burden of proof for fear that rape law might be used against those who oppose the state, including trade union and Dalit activists. To quote Lothika Sarkar, and I think it's, this is particularly relevant today, when asked about presuming the lack of consent in all cases of rape, she asked, do you want to hand over such power to the government just after we have come out of the emergency? Don't you realize that such power could be used to stifle all political dissent? I also argue that the feminist expansion of the anti-rape platform to one of sexual violence envisioned a correspondingly enlarged role for criminal law. Their main criticism of the CLA right after the law was passed was in fact its undercriminalization of marital rape and rape by the armed forces. Over time, they've consolidated a narrative of sexual subordination that is remarkably close to Anglo-American radical feminism, one which was contested and challenged by LGBT advocates, children's rights activists, and in 2013 by Marxist feminists. Finally, feminists have themselves acknowledged their changing relationship with the state since the 1990s and the consequent mainstreaming of women's issues and the professionalization of feminism. This they, see mark, this they say marked an important break from the protest activism of the late 1970s and 80s. Meanwhile, law has been the most used and criticized sphere for struggle within the Indian women's movement. 
This paradoxical status notwithstanding, feminists have collaborated with the state at sites of state feminism, of which India is a pioneer, with the goal of regulatory reform, assisted in no small measure by the increasingly evangelical role played by feminist lawyers. The shift within the Indian women's movement from protest to collaboration then refers to the changing mix of protest in relation to collaboration, namely less protest and more collaboration. In 2013, feminists did lose out on key issues such as the age of consent and the retention and expansion of the marital rape immunity. But Section 375 retains the gender specificity of rape. Rape now covers penile and non-penile penetration. The CLA has an affirmative consent standard, a substantial portion of which appeared in the Sexual Violence Bill proposed by feminists in 2010 and in the Verma Committee report. Explanation 2 to Section 375 clarifies that the lack of physical resistance shall not be construed as consent. This was again formulated in the Sexual Violence Bill. The grounds under which aggravated rape under Section 376.2 can be charged have been doubled from 7 to 14, and many of these additional grounds were first proposed by feminists in 1993 and listed in the Sexual Violence Bill, drawing directly from the concept of power rape. Section 114A of the Indian Evidence Act of 1872 expanded the presumption of lack of consent beyond custodial rape situations to cover all cases of aggravated rape. The CLA also incorporated the Verma Committee's recommendations, in turn influenced by feminist theory of sexual violence, by including separate offenses against stalking, committing, a sexual, uh, committing an acid attack, voyeurism, disrobing, trafficking, and sexual harassment. Many of the new offenses are non-bailable and repeat offenders are subject to increased penalties. The CLA also strengthens rape shield provisions. And there is no better evidence of feminist influence on Indian rape law than the contrast between the government's 2012 bill pre-Nirbhaya, which was introduced on December 12, 2012, and the Verma-inspired CLA. Now, coming to the law's implementation, Joanne Conahan, in a recent article on the essence of rape, argues for a stepping away from an essentialist understanding of rape. She observes, the politics of rape are inevitably more intense at a time when notions of sex and sexuality are being radically remade. Rape discourse has become a channel for debating what kinds of socio-sexual relations we are trying to promote or discourage, and the role law should play in this regard. Approaching rape through an agnostic rather than consensus-seeking paradigm gets at this critical dimension of contemporary rape politics, while encouraging an apprehension of rape through its discursive articulations, which are in turn entangled in a complex, historically entrenched network of social relations, practices, and beliefs. I want to adopt this agnostic position to, through a legal realist analysis of the CLA. And for this, I propose thinking about rape in relational terms. Now, the CLA does this when it names certain forms of relational rape as aggravated rape, for example, where the defendant uh, is a relative, a guardian, or a teacher, but it does so for expanding the realm of criminal law. I use it instead to think about the law's likely implementation. And approaching rape relationally exposes a larger set of background legal rules, thereby enabling a more precise distributional analysis of rule changes. A relational approach to rape is also necessary in light of recent crime statistics. So according to the 2017 NCRB report, which was just published, in 93% of registered rape cases, the offender was known to the survivor. And as we may recollect, the Hindu study of rape cases in six Delhi district courts in the CLA's first year of operation confirmed these trends. Of the 583 cases studied, 41% involved consensual sex, where family members registered rape cases to protest women's choices of sexual partners. In 23% of the cases, the couple engaged in consensual sexual intercourse on the basis of a failed promise to marry. Two-thirds of the rape cases thus dealt with consensual sex. Of the remaining cases, of the remaining one-third of the cases involving non-consensual intercourse, almost twice as many cases implicated a defendant known to the survivor than did, than did not. Now, only 21 of the 583 cases involved stranger rape. And so there have been many new, exciting uh, empirical studies uh, which updates uh, this information. So for example, Arushi Garg's study of rape cases in Delhi district courts in 2014 and 2016 confirmed these trends with 84 out of 254 cases relating to the breach of promise to marry. Preeti Dash also shows in her work how between 2013 and uh, 2017 in the state of Delhi of the cases decided under pre-CLA law 
23.5% of the cases dealt with breach of promise to marry. And under the CLA, the corresponding figure was 28.4%. Empirical research in Lucknow session quotes of pre-CLA cases by Neetika Vishwanath also showed how out of the 95 trials that she observed, 52 involved runaway marriages by minors, where parents opposed any relationship between the consenting parties to sex. Similarly, Huck in a 2017 report found that out of 224 cases under POXO in Delhi, 35% dealt with romantic relationships. Partners for Law and Development has also found that most of the cases they studied that involved uh, the use of POXO and the Prohibition of Child Marriage Act involved self-arranged marriages by adolescents. So empirical research thus shows that anywhere up to two-thirds of rape cases deal with consensual sex. And of the cases of non-consensual sex that exist, a majority of the accused are known uh, to the victim. So based on these profiles of prosecutions for rape, my distributional analysis of the CLA focuses on two main categories of sexual interactions. The first is, of course, non-consensual sex, including between strangers or between parties who are known to each other but are not in a prior legal relationship, or between parties in a pre-existing legal relationship, such as marriage or employment. And then the second category is of consensual sex, including where third parties object to such consensual sex, or where consent is given by one party contingent on the satisfaction of a certain condition by the other. Um, now, when we look at non-consensual sex between strangers or parties known to each other but not in a prior legal relationship, um, we find that the CLA could potentially reduce the tolerated residuum of abuse to enhance women's sexual autonomy. So in the case of stranger rape, with the CLA's new definition of consent, it would be easier to prosecute men for having sex with women, not only where women resisted, fought back, and screamed, but also where they began to resist but gave up, did not even begin to protest due to disadvantageous circumstances, did not want the sex but felt socially pressured to agree as a result of their upbringing, or were worried that resisting would result in adverse consequences for themselves and their families. The prosecution is assisted here by precedent not requiring corroboration of the survivor's testimony and quite stringent rape shield laws. Further, with the expansion of power rape from purely custodial context to everyday situations of power imbalance and the attendant reversal of the burden of proof, it would be easier for the prosecution to convict rapists who are acquainted with the survivor. So examples could include abuse by an uncle or father-in-law of a young relative, by a medical professional caring for a pregnant patient, by a teacher or PhD supervisor of a female student, by an employer of a domestic worker, by an upper caste head of village of a female Dalit farm worker, or by a garment factory owner of a female worker. Now, when we go to consensual sex between partners, while the affirmative consent standard built into the CLA will target much forced sex that women routinely submit to, it will also have repercussions for consensual sex. So consent is a complex idea to grasp. And here we have Paramita Vora, who observes that consent is not a tangible object. It is an intangible response that formulates itself, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. Between these forbidding monoliths of yes and no is the real value of consent, where you have the time to exist in a maybe. A time of making a choice, whether to walk together for a while, to have sex, to be in love or not, to simply enjoy the erotic charge between you and others. And then she concludes that respecting that choice, expecting that choice, um, is consent. So now recollect, um, if you just go back to the previous slide. So now recollect the definition of consent in the CLA, wherein the value of consent, or a maybe as Vora calls it, uh, would be a no. So the definition also begs the question of whether a woman or a man can ever possess complete capacity, freedom, and information to agree unequivocally to sex. So consider scenarios where a woman desired sex during se a sexual encounter but was ambivalent about the man or the circumstances. A woman who desired sex with a man but was ambivalent as to the specific acts. A woman who desired sex including all of the specific sexual acts but did not communicate her consent to every single act. Or a woman who communicated consent by simply engaging in sex rather than by offering verbal or other affirmation of consent. Now, the definition also assumes full rationality and single-mindedness. But what if a woman is mistaken, confused, or conflicted about her state of mind, changes her mind, forgets her previous state of mind, or is of two minds at the same time? In all these instances, the affirmative consent standard would recast anything less than an unequivocal yes as a no. Now, in particular, and this has been well documented, 
where a considerably higher number of adolescent couples engage in sex across caste, class, or religious lines, or even within these boundaries but against their family's wills, the man could face prosecution for rape launched by the fa woman's family. Parents can also mobilize a provision on aggravated rape against teenage sex. So prior to the CLA, as we all know, the age of consent was 16, and therefore the rape of a girl under the age of 12 was aggravated rape. The CLA shifted this upwards so that um, the age of consent was 18 and rape of a girl under the age of 16 was aggravated rape. Now with the 2018 amendment, rape under the age of 16 is punishable with a minimum of 20 years to life. Further, we could see that a, a male offender between the ages of 16 and 18 can be tried as an adult, although under POXO he would not be able to consent to sex. Furthermore, the parents of an adult woman can pursue a charge for aggravated rape under Clause K of Section 376.2, which was also added in 2013, pertaining to rape by a man in a position of control or dominance. So Clause K is therefore ripe for an interpretation that consensual sex between two adults from different religious caste or class communities is aggravated rape. Now, the next category that I want to con consider is consensual sex contingent on an unfulfilled condition. So in India, given the continuing stigma of premarital sex, women who have sex with men because they were promised marriage, but who were later spurned, have prosecuted their partners for rape. Now, some high courts have convicted these men on the basis of Section 90 of the IPC, under which consent given under misconception of fact is not consent. Yet other high courts, and more recently the Supreme Court, have ruled that a mere breach of promise to marry will not result in a conviction for rape. Instead, the offender's motives would have to be examined. A man would be guilty of rape only if his intention all along was to have sex without marrying, not of the, not of the marriage failed to materialize for unavoidable circumstances. These decisions were, however, rendered pre-CLA. The new definition of consent requiring an unequivocal voluntary agreement communicated for specific sexual acts places a premium on female sexual autonomy. On a broad interpretation of affirmative consent, men who breached their promise to marry could arguably be prosecuted for rape. Now, criminalizing these interactions as rape will undoubtedly bring redress to some women, but will dramatically rearrange patterns of sexual bargains between consenting adults outside of marriage. And this can undermine their zones of sexual freedom by penalizing the breach of promise to marry as rape. For this reflects the premium placed on marriage in Indian society, thus reinscribing the hegemony of the heteropatriarchal institution of marriage. So I next want to come to uh, non-consensual sex between parties in an existing legal relationship. Uh, and I want to look at marital rape. So if 93% of rapists are known to their survivors, a significant proportion of rape must occur at two institutional sites, the workplace and the family. Now the CLA, as we know, refused to remove the husband's immunity for marital rape. And there have been considerable disagreements amongst feminists on the marital rape immunity and whether we should press for the criminalization of adult marital rape. And alternatives to a criminal law remedy are critical to this discussion. So these include suing for divorce under family law, pressing charges under various sections of the IPC, including section 498A, and pursuing civil remedies under the protection of women from Domestic Violence Act of 2005. Now for feminists, the question of whether to invest scarce resources in litigation rather than aim at governance reform can be assisted by appreciating the CLA's distributional effects on wives through a legal realist analysis. For this, we need to think of wives in three different categories. So wives who are subject to marital rape but are not close to the point of exit or divorce. Wives who are subject to marital rape and are close to the point of exit. And thirdly, wives who are close to the point of exit but are not sexually abused. Now the first category of wives is subject to a continuum of forced sex from unwanted sexual intercourse to unpalatable sexual acts accompanied by physical, emotional, or social harassment. A wife in this category may simply assume such unwanted sex to be part of the marriage deal and in response adopt a range of under the radar strategies from feigning illness to holding back on various other commitments. She may next resort to family, friends, and other elders for counseling her husband. And if all else fails, she may consider legal options. But resorting to state law would invite the husband's retaliation and a demand for divorce. Moreover, she may still want her husband in her life rather than behind bars. So for her, even a complaint to the police may readjust marital bargaining power in her favor, given reports that in the decade following the PWDVS passage, husbands now inflict stealth levels of violence sufficient to assert their control over their wives without being visible. 
without being visible enough to warrant a visit from the local policeman. So such a wife may use the PWDVA, but is unlikely to pursue criminal action. And so it is unlikely that the removal of the marital rape immunity will shift her bargaining endowments very much. Now, coming to wives who are subject to marital rape and or extreme physical violence, a husband's sodomization of one such wife with a torch after which she bled for 60 days led her to challenge the constitutionality of the marital rape immunity. These wives, having long endured escalating sexual violence, are closer to the point of exit and therefore more determined to pursue legal action than wives in the first category. They may initially be reluctant criminal law because of both the husband's expanded immunity now under Section 375 and the need for protracted engagement with the police. This leaves them with the PWDVA and family law. And pursuing both criminal law for offenses other than rape, such as cruelty and unnatural sex, and civil law options means that their outcomes become interdependent. So initially, irrespective of whether criminal charges result in conviction or acquittal, merely filing such a charge improves a wife's bargaining power in the civil system. An acquittal for sexual abuse will, however, undermine her divorce case on the basis of cruelty. A conviction will have the opposite effect. Now, a success in the civil arena, on the other hand, may or may not assist with conviction. A failure in the civil realm will negatively affect the criminal outcome. So a complainant may, of course, choose not to pursue both options. Yet for some wives, a civil remedy will simply not suffice. So one survivor of marital rape refused to legally divorce her husband so that he would not remarry and abuse another woman, insisting that he be punished. Now, coming on to the third category, uh, questioning the need for criminalizing marital rape, some feminists point to Section 498A of the IPC as it deals with cruelty against a wife inflicted by her husband or relatives. Now, Section 498A has ironically developed a reputation for opportunistic use, um, leading uh, the, the Supreme Court to issue guidelines in 2017 for its appropriate use uh, before rolling it back um, in 2018. Now, as Srimati Basu, a feminist ethnographer of family courts, has pointed out, women commonly file criminal and civil cases simultaneously, hoping that the threat of jail time, loss of employment, and social embarrassment will offer leverage for a better divorce settlement alimony and custody settlements. Now, the removal of the marital rape immunity in 2013 may have added another bargaining tool rendered especially powerful by the definition of consent for this category of wives against their husbands. So had the CLA removed the husband's immunity for marital rape, it would have had mixed consequences. For wives not close to the point of exit, but who have been raped, it would have likely had only a symbolic effect. For wives in divorce proceedings but not subject to marital rape, it would have enhanced their bargaining power to negotiate better outcomes. Wives who were raped and close to the point of exit would have benefited the most. Although even for them, the benefits are not obvious given the complex interrelationship between criminal and civil remedies. Thus, any feminist attempt to reform the law, especially when asking for more criminal law, must acknowledge the complex bargain struck between men and women, whether sex sexually abused or not, before, during, and at the termination of a marriage to assess what is the highest priority task for feminists. And I think this analysis also illustrates how we cannot take for granted anything as coherent as women's interests. So the distributive effects of the CLA are thus uneven. Any benefits further need to be assessed alongside costs given the colonial edifice of our criminal justice system, the CLA's lack of sentencing policy, and its introduction of both life imprisonment for the remainder of one's natural life and the death penalty after decades of isolating its use to the rarest of rare cases on constitutional grounds. And this cost-benefit analysis uh, was true even before the CLA Amendment Act of 2018, uh, which has increased minimum mandatory punishments, uh, removed the distinction between rape and aggravated rape, and expanded the use of the death penalty. In fact, Project 39A reports show that the death penalty is being actively used for cases involving murder and sexual violence. So in 2017, 87% of the cases where courts awarded the death penalty were for murder simplicity and murder along with sexual violence. Further, there was an increase in the award of death penalty for murder along with sexual violence, but not murder per se. So the death penalty was awarded for murder uh, to 87 defendants in 2016 and 51 defendants in 2017. Whereas for murder with sexual violence, it was awarded to 24 defendants in 2016 and 43 defendants in 2017. So now I want to turn to my second um, case study, which is of trafficking. 
Now, trafficking has long been used in ideological and legal senses as equivalent to sex work. Hence, I'll be referring here both to anti-trafficking and anti-sex work laws. Now, as with rape, I illustrate the processes which led to the passage of the trafficking bill in 2018 in the Lok Sabha before it lapsed prior to its being introduced in the Rajya Sabha. So I want to illustrate how the governmentalization of the state is optimized both by actors in leftist social movements, but also on the right by conservative groups. Also, how population groups like sex workers acting in political society with limited power and faltering access to state institutions relate to the state and to the criminal law and how they liaised with the Indian women's movement in the post-Nirbhaya moment to counter further criminalization of what society understands as sexual violence. So the profile of civil society actors working on trafficking is quite different from those working on rape. Now the historical association of trafficking with sex work, an issue riddled by intense feminist polarization, both internationally and amongst Indian feminists, led Indian feminists to largely ignore the problem of sex work and trafficking. And the vacuum this left was occupied by anti-trafficking NGOs. And these include radical feminist neo-abolitionist groups like Apne Aap and Prajwala. And this is the, um, the poster which, uh, which you'll see on the Facebook site of Prajwala, who are governance feminists. And non-feminist NGOs like Shakti Vahini and Bachpan Bachao Andolan, who are opposed to sex work. Now, the latter set of NGOs who are not feminist are persuaded by a cultural nationalist and socially conservative politics that seeks to protect the dignity of Indian men, uh, of Indian women and children. And all of these groups are heavily invested in raids, rescue, and rehabilitation, and adopt the techniques that Bernstein characterizes as militarized humanitarianism. And these interventions have benefited from US development aid. So one study of foreign funding by the UN for anti-trafficking interventions showed India to be receiving 19 million US dollars a year since 2000, second only to Afghanistan. These groups are also networked with major philanthrocapitalist NGOs, such as the Walk Free Foundation, which adopt a neo-abolitionist approach to trafficking, or what they call modern slavery. And here they're drawing on the, uh, the long history of uh, abolitionist um, attempts to, to do away with transatlantic slavery. Um, these groups have also found support in state feminists, like the Ministry of Women and Child Development. Now, sex workers and transgender groups, meanwhile, include social movement organizations, service delivery NGOs, and sex workers union. And now, India has, had a long, uh, has long had an anti-sex work criminal law, the Suppression of Immoral Traffic in Women and Girls Act of 1956, or CETA, passed pursuant to India's ratification of the 1949 UN Convention for the Suppression of the Trafficking Persons, which advocates abolishing sex work. So CETA is actually one of the earliest laws born out of governance feminism. Feminists from the nationalist movement, when lobbying for the law, prioritized rehabilitation over penalization to be operationalized by female police officers and state-run homes staffed by female social workers. Now, sex workers unsuccessfully challenged the constitutionality of CETA, and then the CETA was amended in 1986 to enhance certain penalties and was renamed the ITPA. Now, several aspects of sex work are criminalized under the ITPA, although the sale of sex per se is not. And this ambiguity vests enormous levels of discretion in the police, resulting in extensive rent-seeking arrangements. So the police use a range of criminal laws to arrest and prosecute sex workers rather than other exploitative stakeholders in sex markets, thereby expecting payoffs, both monetary and sexual, in order to refrain from implementing the law. So the ITPA undermines sex workers' economic bargaining power in more ways than one. Thus, the sexual abuse that the state both tolerates and inflicts under the ITPA on sex workers is considerable. Now, starting in the early 1990s, HIV prevention initiatives brought in valuable resources that helped sex workers organize around the country. And the National Commission for Women, however, took a position early on to abolish sex work. And this has become the state's default policy. There was, however, no move to amend the ITPA. So in the following years, what several neo-abolitionist NGOs did, like Prajwala, Prerna, and Shakti Vahini, was to actively undertake PIL, to hold a weak and understaffed executive and ineffective and corrupt police accountable for the prosecution of exploiters and traffickers, for the framing of a victim's pro protection protocol, guidelines for proper rehabilitation, and the provision of compensation to victims. And they soon became repeat players before the Supreme Court and the Delhi and Mumbai High Courts. 
Now, meanwhile, internationally, with the negotiation of the Palermo Protocol on trafficking in 2000, several states conflated trafficking with sex work. And the Swedish model of criminalizing customers of sex workers while decriminalizing sex workers became popular. At the same time, the US State Department, under the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act of 2000, started to rank governments annually in the trafficking in persons reports in terms of their actions to prevent, prosecute, and punish trafficking. Now, in 2004, when India was downgraded from Tier 2 to the Tier 2 watch list in the TIP reports, the government proposed to amend the ITPA to criminalize customers of trafficked sex workers, in effect, the Swedish model. And sex workers groups were able to ward off the amendment in 2009 by exploiting differences of opinion within the union government, particularly between the health ministry on the one hand and the ministries of home and women and child development on the other, given the harm such a law could do to HIV prevention efforts. Now, a new set of new abolitionist NGOs such as Apne Aap and the Bachpan Bachao Andolan, meanwhile, also started to litigate. And they assisted the executive in setting up various specialist state agencies, like the special juvenile police units and children's shelter homes. They drafted operating protocols for their functioning. They conducted on-the-ground work of rescue operations. They thus interacted with local state functionaries, including the police, district magistrates, anti-human trafficking units, and children's welfare communities. Uh, committees, sorry. So over time, the exec uh, executive came to heavily rely on these NGOs when the state needed experts for enacting legislative reform. And this is how key new abolitionist NGOs have been appointed to every single expert committee on trafficking, whether court directed or set up by the executive on its own initiative. Thus, new abolitionist NGOs, feminists, and otherwise assumed increasingly influential roles in deciding anti trafficking law and policy. Now, in 2012, these groups had the year of the Verma Committee. So if you look at the report carefully, it expresses some classic radical feminist arguments linking child sexual exploitation, trafficking, sex work, and a rape culture. Hence, it was little surprise that the committee proposed a standalone offense of trafficking in the IPC conflating voluntary sex work with trafficking. And surprisingly, feminists welcomed the report as signaling a paradigm shift in countering violence against women. And then the criminal law ordinance of 2013, in fact, adopted the committee's recommendation. And at a time when feminists were decrying the ordinance for other reasons, Bachpan Bachao Andolan Apne Aap welcomed it. And it was only when the National Network of Sex Workers protested that committee members clarified that they meant to exclude voluntary sex work from trafficking. So ultimately, Section 370 of the CLA did not uh, conflate uh, sex work with trafficking. Now, meanwhile, a 2004 petition filed by Prajwala before the Supreme Court came alive, and upon receipt of a report prepared by NALSA on trafficking, the Supreme Court disposed of this long-standing petition on the ministry's assurance that it would legislate on trafficking. And so this was the origin of the Trafficking of Persons Prevention, Protection, and Rehabilitation Bill drafted in 2016. Now, there is a lot to be said about the trafficking bill, and I've actually said a lot about it. So I'll just share with you some of the titles of my various on the bill that just gives you an idea of how problematic the bill is. So the first version was in 2013, a battle half won. Uh, then it became empty gestures for the 2016 bill, the new abolitionism's last laugh, the criminal law as sledgehammer when the 2018 draft came out, the trauma of rehabilitation, and finally, that good intentions are simply not enough. Um, and so in a nutshell, if we look at the trafficking bill, it's a highly carceral piece of law, like many other criminal laws passed since 2012. And the bill entrenches a classic raid, rescue, rehabilitation model alongside robust criminal law, alongside a, a robust criminal law system with cognizable and non-bailable offenses, bail provisions that presume guilt, reversals of burden of proof, high minimum mandatory penalties, provisions for forfeiting traffickers' assets, and an adjudication missionary with special courts and special public prosecutors. All sounds quite familiar. Now, it also envisages a powerful surveillance role for the National Anti-Trafficking Bureau. And the bill introduces a new offense of aggravated trafficking. And the list is very long of these um, uh, offenses of aggravated trafficking. And they apply to trafficking for certain purposes, which are quite extensive. So for example, trafficking for bonded labor, forced labor, bearing a child, for marriage, for begging, and interestingly, for encouraging illegal migration into India or of Indians abroad. 
similarly, it has an aggravated offense of trafficking for trafficking through certain means, such as administering hormones. Um, when trafficking results in grievous harm or where it involves a vulnerable victim. The bill also had new offenses unrelated to trafficking, which would have amounted to censorship, and vaguely worded offenses with disproportionate sentencing. Now, even between 2016 and 2018, when the bill uh, went through many drafts, every iteration of the bill moved up the index of carcerality. Um, the bill also introduces absolute liability offenses. So section 19, for example, states that where a person is prosecuted for committing an offense under this act uh, against a child or a woman um, or a person suffering from disability, uh, the court shall presume that he or she committed the offense unless the contrary is proved. So here there's a presumption um, so a presumption as to a culpable state of mind was first introduced in Section 35 of the Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act of 1985 to secure improved rates of conviction. However, Section 19 goes well beyond presuming a culpable state of mind to effectively presuming the commission of the offense unless otherwise proved. And the prosecution therefore does not have to prove either the actus reus of the mens rea for fixing criminal liability. And there's a similar provision like this in POXO, which strangely has not been litigated adequately, but I suspect that it is constitutionally uh, unsound. Um, so now a major, uh, or rather much advertised feature of the trafficking bill was this victim-centered approach. So for this, the bill envisions building out a welfare bureaucracy consisting of protection homes and rehabilitation homes run by the government and by NGOs in each district but with very little accountability. And this is despite the fact that such homes under the ITPA, as well as the Juvenile Justice Act, have been ineffective at best. So certainly with the ITPA homes, it has caused women to escape and return to sex work, or these homes have themselves become hotspots of sexual abuse. And we've witnessed the chaos and violence of such homes since the 1980s when Professor Upendra Bakshi filed the Agra Homes case to the most recent Muzaffarpur Homes case. Now far from giving, victims an explicit choice regarding rehabilitation, the bill provides for the judge to refuse a victim's request not to be sent to a home if the judge thinks the request is not voluntary. So the position is very much in line with the ITPA. And the collaboration between the state and NGOs, which is envisaged by the bill, in fact aims to produce what Jennifer Musto calls carceral protection. So here the carceral state is the protector, but both state and non-state oriented assistant procedures in fact blur the boundaries between punishment and protection, victim and offender, and state and non-state authority. So Musta argues that the replacement of state by non-state actors who assist in the identification, protection, and management of victims does not reduce their exposure to law enforcement, but simply softens it and extends it in various ways. It is little surprise then that the non-criminalization clause for victims of trafficking under this bill, wherein they would normally have immunity from certain crimes they committed while being trafficked, is quite restrictive. Now the trafficking bill is also a telling example of how driven by the spectacle of sexual violence and, and organized crime networks, the criminal law has colonized the regulatory space of labor laws and social welfare laws. Indeed, the trafficking bill is formed in the ITPA's mold, which it mindlessly extends to other labor sectors resulting in absurdities such as shutting down places of employment like farms and households as though they were brothels. Notably, the bill is silent on its relationship with various laws which India pioneered in the 1970s and 80s in order to address forms of ex extreme exploitation which we might understand today as trafficking, namely bonded labor, contract labor, and interstate migrant work. Now, these social welfare laws adopted administrative law models and community-based rehabilitation to address extreme exploitation. And they were interpreted by the Supreme Court in the 80s to develop a robust forced labor jurisprudence, which declared that any work paid with less than the minimum wage would be forced labor. Now, this jurisprudence is not a relic of the socialist 70s and 80s. In fact, it has been reiterated in the context of the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act thus holding the state accountable for not paying minimum wages under the act in the face of acute agrarian distress. 
The trafficking bill, however, erodes these indigenous vocabularies and mechanisms to deal with extreme exploitation, a task which may be rendered complete by the ongoing consolidation of labor laws from which only the Bonded Labor System Abolition Act may be safe, and then maybe it is not safe, because groups like the International Justice Mission in their raid rescue and rehabilitation efforts have also tried to have judges to interpret the Bonded Labor Act in quite problematic ways. Now, the 2018 trafficking bill, I should again reiterate, did not become law. But any new iteration of the bill, which I understand is currently in the works as we speak, is likely to derive from its template. So now sex workers um, groups put up an admirable resistance to the bill, working shoulder to shoulder with transgender groups who are also battling the transgender persons um, bill that came up at the same time. Uh, their struggles, I suggest, help us rethink the carceral politics of sexual violence. Now, whatever the differences um, between governance feminists themselves, between the radical feminists and the more materialist feminists in the Indian women's movement, um, who lobbied for reform on rape and trafficking, they understand anti-female sexual violence quite broadly, and they rely on the criminal law to address it. Now, in the absence of a vision of desirable sex, Casting the net of sexual violence wide runs the risk of entrenching normative visions of good sex and bad sex. And feminists may not desire this, but are willing to take the risk to counter sexual violence. Now, sex workers, meanwhile, acknowledge their constrained choice in doing sex work under capitalist patriarchy, but they resist its characterization as sexual violence. They instead problematize the divide between marriage and sex work, wherein sex work is treated as exceptionally harmful in relation to marriage. They further call for a theory of pleasure, just as Marxism offered an analysis of labor and production. So a theory of sexual violence thus also needs a theory of pleasure, accounting for women who are both inside and outside the system of alliance. Now, relatedly, sex workers groups also account for the interests of men. So governance feminists active on both rape and sex work attribute sexual violence to men. Men's interests in the context of rape are accommodated within a liberal legal paradigm of fairness in the criminal trial. Men's status as survivors of violence and contrast is legible only in their status as social women. Feminists have thus remained strongly committed to the male-female diet to theorize patriarchal sexual violence and recognize male interests only so long as they do not contaminate the interests of females. Now, for sex workers, however, men figure prominently. I think far from problematizing male sexual needs, sex workers reiterate assumptions about the inevitability and irrepressibility of male sexual desire, which if unchecked, they claim, would jeopardize the safety of all women. And being sex radicals, which is evident in their slogan, we want bread, we also want roses, sex workers seek to destabilize the hierarchies of acceptable sexual practices and accept the free exercise of sexual choice, whether it be for pleasure, livelihood, or procreation. And they call for sexual diversity outside the folds of heteropatriarchal marriage and family. Hence, they are attuned to the sexual needs of disabled, single, and migrant men who come to them. Sex workers also desire men, they say, to meet their own sexual needs. And so criminalizing men thus adversely affects sex workers every single time. So the erotic landscape, and with that, an accounting of male interests differs quite dramatically for governance feminists and sex workers. Now, finally, Governance feminists, for the most part, are deeply invested in criminal law reform, even while acknowledging that the state can be weak, ineffective, and can in fact generate perverse outcomes. They view the gap between the law and the books and in action as a problem of inefficient and corrupt governance. Now, sex workers, meanwhile, experience state law itself as abusive, and they have a deeply oppositional stance towards every aspect of the criminal law, particularly the ITPA, even though it criminalizes exploitative stakeholders in sex work, including landlords and brothel keepers. In fact, in protest marches against the 2005 amendment to the ITPA, DMSC, the Calcutta Sex Workers Group, routinely enacted a gallows scene where the noose of the ITPA was around the neck of a sex worker, dressed as a prisoner. Thus, where feminists use the law to oppose violence against women, sex workers have deployed the very same advocacy opportunities to resist the violence of the law. So, in conclusion, the carceral politics of sexual violence is alive as well, uh, is alive and well. And I have illustrated this in today's talk by focusing on rape and trafficking. And significant reforms on both rape and trafficking were introduced in 2013. 
and their carceral infrastructure has been or has sought to be expanded over a mere five years later with the Criminal Law Amendment Act in 2018 and the proposed trafficking bill in 2018. So much of my analysis today can be performed for the POCSO Act, which was amended in 2019. And it is intuitive to understand the expanding carceral imagination of the state in terms of its efforts to secure hegemony in the face of the horrific sexual abuse of women and children by passing tough on crime laws. The lack of implementation of these laws can also be explained away in terms of the justice gap and the patriarchal logic of the law and its institutions and the rape culture of society. While these explanations are valid, they are not adequate. And I've sought to show how the carceral imagination of the state does not belong to the state alone, and that the state is in fact thoroughly governmentalized, such that civil society actors infiltrate state power at various levels of governmental function with different rates of success. And while important victories have been secured in the process, and the tolerated residuum of abuse is likely to have shifted, hopefully even reduced, even if by a little bit, they have come at a cost. So we are now faced with an inverse pyramid of reform where regulatory reform has trumped governance reform and where spectacular cases of sexual violence drive regulatory reform to the detriment of consensual sex arrangements, whether mediated by the market or not. And as sexual norms churn under the surface of Indian society, we need to halt the expanding reach of the criminal law. And where we wish to engage with it, attempt a legal analysis to assess the payoffs before, during, and after the passage of criminal law. Thank you. Thank you, Prabha, for that provocative and forceful uh, intellectual journey. Um, and I'm sure there are tons of questions. Uh, we have about 20 minutes for questions. Uh, and I would really appreciate it if you could keep your questions or comments extremely short. Uh, and, I, and I'm just going to stop you if you exceed 90 seconds, uh, right? It just, just in the interest of trying to get as many questions as possible, and I'm sure there are lots. Um, so please, let's just respect everyone's time. So no more than 90 seconds, crisp questions, right? Or comments, so yeah. Uh, we have two questions there at the back. I'll just take three, yeah. And uh, if you could just introduce, your, introduce yourself, your name and where you're from, or? Hi, Prabha. I'm uh, with the Center for Law and Policy Research in Bangalore. And I had, uh, I had three short questions with regards to one large part of uh, the, con the conversation that you're presenting is around the category of sex. So we understood what you mean by political economy, but I, I'm left grappling with a bunch of uh, um, lack of clarity around the category of sex. And I, I want to provoke you into explaining that for us, because on the one hand, you seem to flatten the category of sex. Mm -hmm by using it as uh, interchangeable in a kind of Haley-esque way between sexual identity and sexual practice. Mm -hmm. uh, so you refer to various laws that deal with both sexual identity and sexual practice. You then tend to think of sex as the same as it traverses through the marital to, say, the trans category, which kind of is best exemplified in your example of hormones, which mean different things for different people. And I feel like you, the necessity of this, uh, this charmed circle of Gail Rubin in some sense around political economy, uh, I was quite uh, astounded by the lack of the invocation of the category of caste, because if we were to think about even sex work for what it means for trans people, while it might be in a social hierarchy of place for certain kinds of people to do sex work, so Brahminical patriarchy asks trans people to do sex work, it also means a, uh, a hierarchy of space, because within the gharana, only certain kinds of Dalit and Bahujan people do sex work. So it's far more complicated there. So if you could explain what you mean by sex, thanks. Thank you. Uh, behind, uh, I think Ali had a question. Yeah, uh, ma'am, I was actually confused by this uh, when you were talking about the more extensive definition of rape under the Criminal Law Amendment Act. You stated that now that uh, if the woman changes her consent in the middle of the sexual activity or has only consented to a part of the sexual activity, it uh, like you seem to be troubled by the fact that that is now considered rape. But ma'am, like this seems to be only for sex. If I, for example, consent to give someone a 500 rupee note and he takes the whole wallet, no one reasonable will argue that this is not this is with my consent. So why is there an exemption for say, uh, sex? when, given that it uh, is intimately tied to the administration of your own body, 
the consent should actually be more stringent in that regard, especially as we have a uh, troubling rape problem of rape culture. It's not as if consent is rocket science. Could you please explain what the issue might be in such an extensive definition of consent? Okay. Um, your question there, yeah. If you just also introduce yourselves, please. Good evening, ma'am. I am Prarthana from OP Jindal. So my basic, uh, I have a doubt regarding, so in India, criminal law or uh, sexual criminal law tends to be based on our religious practices that have been followed in India since ages. So what would you say on this aspect? Because I could not grapple anything on the religious aspect from your lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe I can ask you for clarification in terms of what you what you were thinking of uh, uh, in that sense. And yes, it is not you know it is not something that I've referred to. But maybe you can clarify what exactly you were looking for. Uh, Ma'am, uh, we see that uh, most of the ideas uh, regarding the patriarchal ideas of India or the domination of men at home or domestic violence. Uh, takes its ideas from the Brahminical traditions which believed that uh, men are the doers of the house and they should be allowed to take all decisions and women are mere, uh, they, they were not even considered in individually autonomous. So why is it that, like, is, is uh, Indian sexual criminal law different from the international aspect in this sense that it draws its origins from religion? Okay, that's a very interesting question. I think, um, you know, I can't really comment on how it compares with all over the world because I'm sure there are other markers of identity which sim similarly inflect uh, uh, patriarchal thinking around the world. Uh, but certainly I think, um, although I didn't address it particularly in my talk and it's something that I welcome thinking about uh, further, um, I think the idea that, you know, we have a relational theory of rape would account for those kinds of uh, specificity. So I'm very much interested in opening up that conversation. And in fact, when I spoke about the Marxist feminist theory of rape, where um, an, an idea that every class has its own, you know, so this was one of the critiques of uh, uh, feminist thinking around sexual violence, that it is too, uh, it thinks of patriarchy as being monolithic. And therefore, what I'm particularly interested in the Marxist theory was the fact that men and women in different classes would actually have quite different interests in regulating sexual abuse uh, and sexual violence. And that, in fact, you know, this, this is what I was going to say, that in fact you can't simply imagine that women have the same interests or that men have the same interests and that we need to split apart uh, these very categories. So I think, you know, class would be one line along which one would do it and definitely caste would be one line along which one would do it. And in fact, I wouldn't restrict uh, the conversation to even an intersectional analysis where you think of, you know, a poor woman where her uh, her susceptibility to sexual violence is determined by her class and uh, gender status, right? But I would actually think more carefully also about the effects of criminalization in protecting the interests of a certain higher class of women and what this means for lower caste men who would be caught up within the criminal justice system. So I'm very much interested in opening up uh, these categories. Um, so I, I wasn't entirely clear on the, the, the second question. Um, I, I'm not troubled by the affirmative consent standard. Uh, I was only trying to say that it would have quite different consequences. Uh, you know, at some, sometimes it would actually be able to target sexual violence, but at other times that it would actually uh, freeze sexual exchanges uh, between people. And um, so that, that's, that's all I was trying to say. But obviously, women and men have the right to withdraw their consent at any point. So I think th there are some benefits to the affirmative consent standard. And I think your question, actually, in my talk, maybe I went too fast. But when I referred to Gail Rubin, I did say it's particularly true, applicable in India, overlaid with you know, the, the 
the requirements of caste endogamy. So I think it's not something that I've spelled out, and I should, and I welcome the, the, the critique. Uh, and I definitely want to do that. So as I just said, you know, in response to the question on religion, I'm very, I'm quite interested in understanding precisely, and I think it, it is difficult, because I think some of my previous work on sex work has understood it as a form of labor, and um, as a, but I do understand that this form of social reproduction is very much based on uh, the caste system and how you think about it. And I think there is a need for more empirical, just as you gave the example, I think in my research I found that there were, you know, that there was this kind of hierarchy even within brothels where women worked, that, you know, certain lower caste women performed only certain kinds of sex, and then, you know, and then there are quite different um, affects that sex workers have vis-a-vis -vis their work depending on their caste status. So I think it is something that's extremely crucial, and I really welcome the provocation to think more about it. Um, and I think on the question of sex, I think it is a, it's a very, uh, and I, again, uh, really uh, welcome your critique, because I think you're absolutely right. I think in uh, speaking about the political economy of criminal law, right, the theory of sex has somehow gone by the wayside, but I think it is a task that one needs to engage in and uh, is something that um, I think we should speak more about. I think because for, for much of the work that I do, I'm focused so much on uh, trying to think about the interests of women who are outside of uh, marriage, right? Uh, women who are surrogates, women who are bar dancers, women who are sex workers. Um, I think it's been an uphill struggle simply to say that the sex that they perform is equally legitimate, that it should not be exceptionalized in any way. And for me, that is the starting point for thinking about a theory of sex. But I think it's a longer, deeper conversation that we need to have. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Uh, one question right at the back. Hello. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Kushpu and I work as a research assistant. So I had the opportunity to work on a research uh, dissertation in my college. So I was working on exploring the uh, relationships of sex workers with the men in their lives. So I encountered that most of the ladies uh, with whom I had the interaction, so uh, of course they did exercise their agency in deciding who to uh, say yes or no to as a client. But when we're talking about state intervention, so instead of having a uh, protectionist approach, which is very patriarchal, cannot we, uh, ex uh, we should expect the state to rather, you know, work to protect the rights of the sex workers because sometimes uh, it is found that uh, the clients, they are not paying properly or they're being violent. So we cannot tell a lady who to have sex with if, she, if that is uh, what she wants to do, but we can safeguard her interest. So on that grounds, what are the discourses we can have? Like when we are talking, when we are talking about domestic violence, shouldn't we have same extension of the legal discourse to uh, women who are working as sex workers? Thank you. A question there. Hello, I'm uh, Harikatik Ramesh. I'm a third year from NLU Delhi. Uh, my question is that in the presentation you spoke of the movements, uh, the convergence it had when it came to the issue of uh, rape. My doubt comes in as to, we have seen a lot of feminist activism and literature upon the marital law exception and how it creates an inequality for married women. In the light of the transgender bill and the debates which have been going on at the Rajya Sabha and the protests as well, uh, I was just curious as to, did you have any theory or any answer as to where, why is there a silence, a very large silence with respect to the transgender bill, where we see a similar inequality being found where trans folk who have been sexually assaulted would only get, there'd be a two year cap, uh, two year minimum, however, for a cis woman it could be seven years. Uh, I just wanted your thoughts if you could hear, if you knew what was the reason for the difference and the distinguishing which is done by the Indian women uh, movement with respect to these uh, two situations. Thank you. Okay. Question here, right at the front. Hi, ma'am. I'm Sukriti. I'm actually an English teacher. 
and I found the juxtaposition of the rape law with the trafficking law very interesting because on the one hand it seems to me that the law is allowing commodification of sex with the promise of marriage where if a man promises marriage to me um, and does not follow through in that promise it is, it is considered rape but on the other hand if a woman asks for money instead of marriage which is another kind of commodification in itself it is not covered by the law I'd love your comments on that thank you um, an excellent set of questions. So the, I think the, the first question from Kushbu, yes, about uh, sex workers' rights, absolutely. I think uh, there is no question that, uh, you know, a whole range of protections need to be made available uh, to sex workers. And uh, I think, thankfully, the Indian sex workers movement has grown from strength to strength. Um, and there are hundreds of organizations around the country that are uh, precisely campaigning for uh, these rights. Um, I, I mean, and of course, it's it's quite interesting because uh, they would want the ITPA to be repealed. That would be their first step towards, um, you know, removing the violence of the state, and then they can go on to deal with the violence from their clients. And um, I think that's that's quite important. And I think internationally, there's a lot of momentum for the decriminalization of sex work. But I think uh, we can't stop there. I think we need to go further. And um, I, in my previous work, I've looked at uh, uh, the political economy of sex work to see really what is it that determines women's uh, economic bargaining power in sex work. Um, and have looked at a whole range of laws that actually determine this economic bargaining power. So for instance, in Calcutta, I found that it was tenancy practices uh, that in fact affected their economic bargaining power. So I think while violence, dealing with violence is very important and often sex workers are able to do this on their own. So in Sonagachi, there are self-regulatory boards that often deal with disputes in the red light area. In Sangli, there are Tanta Mukti committees, as they're called, which resolve disputes both within the community but also in relation to sex work. So where the state has de facto decriminalized sex work, I think sex workers have on their own found ways of dealing with uh, violence. Uh, and I would say, yes, decriminalization is an important step, but it's simply not enough. I think if we respect um, sex workers' choice to enter sex work, I think we should also think about how uh, they can maximize their returns from sex work. And I think, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, choose to either exit it sooner or work less or do more or whatever. I think the economic bargaining power is something that has to be addressed more explicitly in sex worker struggles around the world. Um, and the question around the Indian women's movement, I think that's uh, that's a very astute observation. And I think I'm equally pained to see that there is a provision in the transgender bill which talks about, and it's the callousness with which that uh, section is drafted. Anyone who tends to abuse a transgender person, it is the most shoddy piece of drafting I've ever seen. Either there is sexual abuse or there isn't. To have a string of different forms of abuse and which someone tends to do, is completely unacceptable. And I think uh, this this indifference, um, I think, um, both on the part of lawmakers, which we are rightly uh, fighting, uh, but uh, troublingly also on the part of the Indian women's movement, I think there's a very long history to this. And this is something I speak about more in my chapter in the book, uh, Governance, Feminism, and Introduction, where I trace in great detail uh, what were the choices the Indian women's movement had to make? So within the Indian women's movement, it's a very sophisticated movement, and I doubt that any of them in this room would actually not uh, go to a transgender rights rally with us. But I think when push came to shove, and they had to push in certain forms of reform, and I think in, so actually when you look at the Sexual Violence Bill of 2010, it's quite a remarkable document, because it's a document on sexual violence that feminists come up with. They draft it on their own, and it shows. And there actually you'll see this kind of different categorization of male upon female and then trans, although they were sympathetic to their cause, it would be a question of, you know, can you think of the trans person as a social woman, which is what I was saying, uh, and then children, where we need a gender neutrality. So the way that they managed this, all these deep troubling tensions within the movement was, of course, you had a separate law on child sexual abuse, which is gender neutral. And I think the trans issue obviously 
uh, got defeated in the context of trying to push for, uh, you know, a, a very typical feminist idea of rape. So, so in the book, I actually talk about how over time the uh, Indian women's movement has adopted more and more of a radical feminist theory of rape, where you can only think of the male-female uh, dyad. Uh, and thank you for your observation, Sukriti, on the, the rape trafficking uh, dynamic. And I think it's actually quite interesting because, and I'd be keen to see, and I've looked into this to see whether uh, sex workers, often when they're not paid, so in the, in, because they lack civil uh, protections and uh, they, like, they lack all kinds of protections and are discriminated against uh, all over the world, actually, uh, often sex workers, when they're not paid by a client, they'll try to file a complaint for rape. And it's quite interesting that uh, certainly in the UK, there's case law saying that uh, that would not be rape, you know, uh, so on the condition, uh, because she consented to the sex. Uh, but, you know, all of, a lot of these case laws have come before uh, an affirmative consent standard. So I think it'd be really key to see how the courts interpret the affirmative consent standard and how far they will go to really d protect the rights of all women and their sexual autonomy. If we take sexual autonomy seriously, then, you know, clearly a sex worker who's not paid for sex work uh, could be considered to be raped. Thank you. Yeah. Just take one final round of questions. And I'm just going to reserve one question for myself out of those last three. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, I think Ish uh, Ishan had a question here right at the front. And at the absolute last, yeah. Hi. I'm sorry to the others. Yeah. So, as ma'am has mentioned, uh, ma'am, you mentioned affirmative consent standard quite a few many times. So, I have a doubt with respect to what school do you prescribe to with respect to the affirmative consent standard? Is it just the general basic affirmative signal that there, there is consent or there should be unambiguous and unequivocal consent? So, with respect to that, uh, I should come to, I will come to second explanation to, uh, which is essentially consent the definition, definition of consent in the IPC. Uh, in that, I feel like the affirmative consent standard, though they mentioned an unequivocal voluntary agreement, but when it actually comes to the form of which, form through which it's, it's expressed, in my mind, the only way you're, you can be unequivocal and unambiguous about it, if it's a verbal yes. Whereas uh, the definition includes uh, any form of gestures, words, or verbal or non-verbal verbal communication, which my, in my head defeats the purpose of an affirmative consent standard if you're taking it to the highest possible pedestal. So ma'am, what would you say with respect to this definition at least? Because in my view at least, I would say that the affirmative consent standard is not being properly applied in the IPC. Hi. Um, my name is Surabhi and I'm a journalist. So my question pertains actually to a third actor that I think uh, we've not heard a lot about it in this talk. Now, uh, you've spoken a lot about governance, feminism, and about the Indian women's movement. And of course, uh, the other part of this is the people who are seeking uh, redressal when it comes to sexual violence. You have obviously the perpetrators and the victims or survivors. Now, I w wanted to hear from you about the role of the state. I think most definitely the state is a part of this sort of conversation, and I think both before Nirbhaya and uh, after that, we've seen a strong presence of the state in what gets enacted as a response, whether it's enacting laws, whether it's um, spreading awareness, whether it's um, sort of taking a stance on what happens when there is sexual violence, the state also becomes an actor. So, um, and of course it's not that the feminists propose and the state disposes, so would you be able to talk a little bit about how the state has intervened over these last few years and, or actually the last few decades and what you've seen uh, happen to the politics of sexual violence and incarceration because of that? Thanks. So, probably my question, um, I guess very predictably, uh, is about uh, the, the Delhi gang rape and the sort of impending uh, executions on it as, as we see more and more movement uh, on it in the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's obviously going to be a big challenge for the feminist movement on what is the response going to be for this extremely loud clamor uh, for executing the four people. Uh, convicted for those offenses. And yet there is a declared position that uh, 
that the, the Indian feminist movement is against the death penalty. Uh, and, and I guess there's a, there's a transition of that position from Dhananjoy Chatterjee to uh, now. Um, but yet that moment is a very critical, uh, as, as with the criminal law amendments. I just want to get your sense of how, how, what dynamics do you see playing out uh, as, as, as that pitch gets uh, louder for executions? And is it, uh, is it go I mean, do you see a proactive response and, and opposition to uh, executions in this case, or is it going to be a more muted uh, death penalty is wrong uh, kind of response? I know. <laughs> yeah. I wish I knew the answer to that. Uh, but I don't, as, as much as I, I like my feminist friends, I, can't, I don't have any insight into what they'll think, uh, you know, a few days from now. But I, I, I do think that, um, I think the feminist movement is so split right now in some ways, um, you know, on the, the rape question, um, on, on a whole range of legal issues in relation to sexual violence. So, um, and I think, I, I suspect that it will be muted uh, rather than more vociferous. I think it should be more vociferous given the expansion of the death penalty. And I think we need to have some more soul searching to uh, really embrace more vigorously a civil liberties tradition which has not uh, been the forte um, of the women's movement. As much as they have uh, had very uh, sophisticated conversations on how the state, um, uh, the way state, the state deals with this is problematic. I think we've never really gone enough to actually uh, examine fully, like the civil liberties activists, uh, what the implications of criminalization are. Um, so I do hope for uh, a more proactive opposition, and I'd certainly want to be part of that. Um, now, in terms of Surabi, I think that your question about the state is just wonderful. It's the biggest black box Right, and I, I think that's a, that's a really important question, and I've thought about it myself because we use the state quite flatly to say the state, you know, and quite opportunistically to say the state acted knee-jerk, actually, um, uh, you know, the, the state is patriarchal. I mean, what, do, what, what exactly does that mean? And I think we need to uh, look at, you know, try to unpack what the black box is in very clear terms. And, I have some thoughts because I think certainly the category of state feminism is very useful for thinking about it. Uh, because clearly India was one of the few countries in the 1970s that uh, had quite explicitly uh, parts of the state to deal with women's issues. And uh, the NCW took very, you know, sort of took a default position on many issues uh, right from the beginning. And I think that influence of the NCW is clearly tapered off in the Ministry of women and child development has become much more influential. So that's one element of the state, the, the front of the state. Um, but I think uh, beyond that, uh, you know, it's, it's quite hard, and, the, the, and it's so deeply contradictory, uh, not just on sexual violence, on many other um, issues of, of, uh, that feminists care about. The state is so riven and so um, uh, can be, I think that's actually a site for activism for us and you know it, it actually is quite productive for us uh, in quite um, important ways and like even and so I think my instinct would be to uh, theorize the state more robustly than simply you know thinking of it as one this monolithic category and certainly if you look at all the the parliamentary debates on the criminal law amendment act and the pox amendment act you know you have to really rethink that idea of the state because you know the the Rajya Sabha MPs clearly um, uh, certainly with the Pox Amendment Act, we're very forthcoming to say that this must be referred to a select committee. So you see a voice of reason there, whereas in the Lok Sabha, it's much more patchy. It really depends on the day and who's forming which alliance with whom, although they, they don't need those numbers. Um, so I think, um, I think I agree with you that we need to theorize the state in relation to um, sexual violence. And I think that is part of my attempt to actually say that when you look at all these laws together, uh, what is frustrating is that many groups, I think, work in silos and don't really talk to each other. And I think it's only when, and, you know, and I've attempted a very basic comparison between two sets of laws, but there are just so many sets of laws that actually the state, after having passed, has undermined our energies because we are all now working on POXO. 
right? I mean, and there's a whole industry around POXO. And, you know, how do we, you know, and the children's rights groups where our energies are completely taken over by the state because they have created the surveillance mechanism, a mandatory reporting. It's created all its sort of unintended consequences. So I think a first step would be to really uh, look at all of these um, next to each other and really understand what is going on. I think that might give us some insight into what the state is thinking, because I don't think any of this is knee-jerk. I think all of this is deliberate. The increased reliance on, uh, on criminal law uh, is quite deliberate, and I think it's something we need to theorize better. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes, your question, sorry, on affirmative consent. I think the, you know, the, the IPC is what it is. You know, I don't think we can really, uh, and, I, I, and I do agree with the definition, and you know, we can quibble about whether it should be verbal or not, but I think given the context of sexual behavior, I think restricting, restricting it to a verbal requirement would make it quite, um, uh, would de-eroticize it in, uh, uh, quite significantly. So I think I, I'm, uh, you know, it is, it, is on, it is on the side of women's sexual autonomy. I think that is a good thing. Um, and it is worrying, obviously, how much consensual sex will, uh, could be recast as rape in the process. But, you know, it'll take many years before we really know what uh, courts think about the, the ambit of um, affirmative consent. But we must pursue the spirit of the section. And I think, again, I don't think we should fetishize regulatory reform. I think there's some excellent work being done by uh, feminists in the room, by PLD, for instance, on unpacking this idea of consent and seeing what does it actually mean in the lives of people and what can it mean. I think it's only when we have that theory of sex, uh, of consent, of pleasure, uh, that we can uh, you know, actually uh, reduce the residue, uh, the tolerated residue of abuse. Because once we set a new threshold for how we want to engage with each other sexually, uh, then we rely less on the law. And then we can make these determinations, uh, we have to reach a new agreed standard. And I think the definition can help us um, in, that, in, in that way. Thank you. Uh, so if you'd like to read more about uh, Prabha's views on some of these issues, please do look up the interviews on The Wire and the live law that was uh, published yesterday. Um, and, and I hope many of us will take up uh, Prabha's invitation to think more, research more, and write more on, uh, uh, and, and do more PhDs on uh, uh, these issues. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, what, as I said, a really provocative uh, lecture and uh, forcing us to think about some really difficult issues. And I do hope all of you have got your copy of the 2018 lecture by uh, Justice Murlidhar. Uh, and please, do, if not, please do pick up a copy before uh, you leave. Uh, and, and of course, this lecture will soon be published and up on our YouTube uh, channel, so please look that up as well. Um, but overall, thank you for a really intellectually stimulating evening, uh, Prabha, and thank you all of you for turning up in such great numbers. Uh, and please do join us for tea and snacks on either side of this auditorium. Uh, so thank you very much and have a good evening. <laughs>